pleasure to introduce an awesome overall human being. Uh, I've got a chance to know uh, Dr. I don't know if you, you go by Tom, but Dr. Tobin over the past year when we're kind of preparing for the plenary. And I just want to introduce him and give him his due introduction. So he is the coordinator of learning technologies at Northwestern Illinois University in Chicago. Oh, Northeastern, thank you. That's a title. Um, he, he holds a PhD in English literature, a second master's degree in information science, a professional project management certification, and he is currently actually, because he can't get enough schooling, right? Um, he's working on a master's in online teacher certification. One really interesting thing about I'm not sure if you know Tom much, but one really interesting thing about him is that when his family asks him, like, hey, what do you do for a living? This is really important to know. He tells his nieces and nephews that he is in the 37th grade. <laughs> <laughs> I'm give him a round of applause for that. So Tom has dedicated his career to serving students whom higher education might otherwise serve poorly or not at all. And this includes these groups. Learners that work and family, have family responsibilities, active duty military students, learners with disabilities, and others from traditionally underserved populations. Um, and I'd also share that same mission just to educate those who the system may not always include. So today, talking to us about everyone's future, getting faculty to adopt universal design for learning, Let's welcome, with the, your most enthusiastic applause, Dr. Tom Tobin. Thank you, Carl, and I want to say thank you to the POD Network, or for those of us who've been here a long time, the POD Network. How many of us remember that? And I also want to say thank you to the folks who've been talking about accessibility and universal design for learning here this year. Folks from the University of Kentucky, where are you? That guy right there, uh, the CUNY folks, the folks from Oregon State, everybody else who had some accessibility or diversity topic today, just give yourselves a hand. Awesome work, folks. You saw during the members' meeting that those stats are going up, and it's increasingly important for us to talk about including students whom we have to serve well before. Why is that so? Because we're running out of traditional students, right? The birth rate went in 1986, and we are reaping the, the minimus of that right now. We're going to get another boom in 2017, 18, 19, in the United States and Canada, at least, and we're going to have a number of traditional age freshmen to work with again. So you see hard budget times these days, you see other things like that. Um, that's going to turn around, that pendulum will swing, swing back. But right now is a good time to talk about universal design for learning. I also, before I want to uh, really get going with you folks, I want to do some housekeeping and a couple of announcements. First, thank you very much to Pod, especially to the core committee and the diversity committee, and especially to my friend Carl Moore for helping set up our time together this morning. You folks are going to have some fun this morning. Yes, I said that. And so what I'd like to do is put a little housekeeping First, how many of you have a mobile device with you that has internet connectivity? Awesome. How many of you, with your hands raised, how many of you have a Twitter account? Well, no surprise in the comments like that's awesome. Please keep your phones or mobile devices on and please log into your Twitter account. We're going to make this an interactive session. Also, that didn't work. Also, one of the first things that they tell you when you become a professional speaker is you need your own fishbowl. That is because if you're looking at the table in front of you, you will see a post-it note. People ask me, is there a difference in the color? Do people with the green ones have a better chance of winning the prize? No, I just got a multicolored deck. But please, at the end of our session today, we're going to draw for three lovely TSA-friendly prizes, <laughs> slim books on universal design for learning, design and deliver, planning and teaching with UDL from Blue Lord Nelson, just published two months ago. You can't even buy it on Amazon yet. I think they're releasing it in two days. And so uh, that's a lovely prize. Universal Design for Learning in Action from Ruby Rap. And the one that I like the best because this is a prize for everybody. This is a paper copy of Universal Design for Learning Theory and Practice. It's from David Rosen, scientist at the CAST Center for Applied Special Technology in Boston. 
And uh, the prize for everybody, if you go to cast.org, C-A-S-T.org, sign up with a username and password, it's for free. You can download the enhanced version of this, the UDL version of this paper book that has the video resources, the audio resources, and it's all shared under Creative Commons. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Oh, the prize drawing. Please take your post-it note and fold it so that the sticky is sticking to itself. That way you don't glom onto anybody else's entry in the fishbowl and doom yourself to glomming to the bottom of the fishbowl. Then please write your name in a way that I can read it on the outside of the fold. I'm at, a, I'm at a factory developers conference, so I, there will be one joker who says, do I write it inside? No, well, then I won't be able to see it. <laughs> and we'll come around later on and, and collect all of these products from us. But I wanted to do this first off, just as a little bit of housekeeping. While you're writing your names, something you're familiar with doing, something you know how to do, something you're all experts at doing, yes, I'm getting a little flip. I'd like you also, when you're done with your prize entry, hop on Twitter and make a prediction. I've had a chance to meet a lot of you at the conference this year. Some of you folks are old friends and colleagues, some of you I've just met this year. But we've been talking in the halls, in the sessions, you know, out <coughs> two in the morning after we got kicked out of a certain someone's room of the Patreon. And we've been talking about how do we make learning more accessible. So make a prediction. When you tweet, and I'll leave this up on the screen for a couple of seconds, just put the pod hashtag, hashtag pod15. I predict, this is me, at Thomas J. Coven, and just say will or won't prove that UDL is always worth doing. And if you want, tell the pod network that you're tweeting by using the at pod network tag. So take a couple of minutes to tweet. While you're doing that tweeting, I'm going to leave this up on the screen, but I also want to tell you a story. This is Katie. <coughs> Katie is a student, was a student, excuse me, at my institution. And how I know Katie is her writing professor came to me and said, Tom, I have a real problem in one of my classes. I have a student whom I know is cheating, but I can't prove it. The professor showed me some of Katie's early work in the course. She had difficulty with topic sentences, often didn't use evidence, details, and examples to support her points. The writing was kind of disjointed, it went all over the place. Not really standard grammatical English. And then the professor showed me two of Katie's most recent essays, just about flawless. And no gradual buildup toward that. And the professor says, you know, I've run this through turn it in. I've put sentences through Google. I've asked my colleagues, does this sound like any professional writer you know? And it all comes up that it's original, but it can't be. There's no way. And so I, I agree with my colleague. This was probably a student who was being academically dishonest and had found a place that wasn't one, two, three, help me, or write essays for you.com, or some other place. And I thought, oh, here's an opportunity to do some research and find out how students are cheating these days that, that we don't even know about yet. So what's the first thing I did? I called the student, right? Hey, Katie, my name's Tom. I work with faculty members to help with their teaching challenges. And I said, Katie, you're doing really awesome work in this course. Tell me how you're doing. Katie told me a very different story. Katie wants to be a K-12 history teacher. And she says that she had been struggling in her college courses all the way through. She understood what the professors were saying in class. She knew what she wanted to say in response. And when it came time to write the papers, what came out of her fingers wasn't what was in her brain. She had gone at mid-semester to our Learning Resources Center, our writing center. Now, our folks in the Learning Resources Center are not trained counselors. They're not psychologists. 
But they figured out that when they talked with Katie, she could actually say what she wanted to say. And then when they said, Katie, please sit down at this computer and write it out, or please grab a piece of paper and a pen and write it out, it didn't come out the way Katie wanted it to. Katie had never been diagnosed with anything. Katie did not have a special piece of paper that said, hey, professor, please treat me differently or give me an accommodation. In fact, after the folks at the Learning Support Center hooked Katie up with Dragon Naturally Speaking, it allowed her to speak into a microphone and have words come out in Microsoft Word. Quality of her writing went up by a lot. So much so that her professor was convinced she was being dishonest, was convinced that she was cheating. So why am I telling you a story about Katie? Well, A, I had to correct myself earlier and say Katie was a student with us. She was on the cusp of dropping out on academic probation. She graduated last year at SUMA. She is now a fifth grade history teacher in the Schaumburg School Districts outside of Chicago. And she's very happy doing what she does. And I felt honored to be a little part of Katie's story. So, if you're not finished tweeting, I apologize. I tried to tell the story in as lengthy as possible ways so if you finish the tweet. But we've been talking about universal design for learning and reaching out to students with disabilities just about since the Quad Network was founded. I went back through the conference proceedings just to see. In 1979, Nick Hertz talking about the model in New Jersey, proposing a concrete and practical effort aimed directly at faculty function with handicapped students, current lingo over there. 1980, um, I don't know how many of you remember the slide tape presentations, but they're available, right? It's the film script with the little cassette that goes beep. <laughs> oh yeah, look at the looks of recognition on some folks' faces. A little trip down memory lane here, also. 1985, a learning disabled adult, the college setting, um, a newsletter that was shared with the rest of the network on using common sense and kindness in teaching students with special needs. 1991, uh, a new newsletter at uh, one of our campuses. The enclosed newsletter features that special needs for the learning disabled students for classroom teaching. We've been talking about this for a long time. Um, in 1993, ADA, developing a successful workshop for faculty, we started talking about how do we work with faculty members in order to get them to understand and apply good principles to reach out to students with disabilities. You hear me saying a word over and over and over again, right? Students with disabilities. Why is it that today, Harvard for edX got sued for non-accessibility of their stuff? We've been talking about this for 40-something years. Now, here's a suggestion. Here's one possible way in which this conversation has gone awry. In 1994, somebody snuck Comic Sans font into the program, and we all were so disgusted that it took a while to recover from that. But that's not the case. 1997, how do we respond to learning disabled adults? Enhancing the educational experience of post-secondary students with disabilities. By 2002, we've got Cheryl Bergstahler talking about things at the, the, the Do It Center at the University of Washington. Uh, one of our research consultants, Tracy Jerkovich, uh, was talking about that Do It model of being able to apply things directly in your classroom. Here's Cheryl's seminal work from To Improve the Academy in 2002. So we have had this conversation. And again, thinking about this. There are some other things that are turning <laughs> 40 this year. In 1975, George Lucas and a bunch of as yet unknown actors were in the desert in Tunisia starting filming on a certain movie. So, you heard me say one word over and over and over again. That word was disability. You don't actually say that out loud all that often, so we get a little practice here. Trick question for you folks. I just started the presentation how you expected I would start the presentation. I talked about people with disabilities, I made the case for why we should reach out to them using universal design for learning. And you know what's going to happen? If that's all we did today, 
You'll go back to your campuses and you'll work with individual faculty members, you'll spread the word about this, and you will get 10% of your faculty members to adopt some kind of universal design for learning strategies. 10%, that's about where we are in terms of penetration and higher education adoption among faculty members if you average things out. Some institutions are doing better than others, but what I'd like to do is a little thought experiment. Now, shout these out. How many of you folks also teach? A lot of us. All right, awesome. So, when the student comes to you with the piece of paper, and to stand in for that, I will use the Pod Diversity Committee white paper. You should all grab a copy of this. There's lunches on the table outside. If you have one, grab one. But the student comes to you with the piece of paper and says, 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 and says, Professor Mary, uh, I'm a student in your class, and I need time and a half on my tests, and I need the software to read the questions out loud to me, and I need to have a human being sitting next to the computer in case the software doesn't do it right, I don't understand what the mechanical voice tells me, so that person can also read the questions to me. Now, Mary's off the book. She doesn't have to respond, unless she wants to. But how does Mary respond to that student? What is the appropriate way to respond to that student? Shout out. Yes. Super. Yes. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. The second part of the thought experiment. Let's see. Okay. Professor Don. Right? Don's got a thick skin, and he can take a little ribbon, so I'm warning him ahead of time. If he doesn't want to be the subject, he can say, no thank you now, and we'll walk away, and we'll actually give him a prize. But, you will? All right, awesome. Professor Don, I say the same thing to you. I need the time and a half, I need the robotic voice, I need somebody to help me out. How might, not does, because we don't know this, but how might Professor Don actually feel when that request comes in. Oh, what a hassle. Yeah, Eric, oh, what a hassle. What else? That's not my job. That's not my job. Just shout them out. I don't have time. I don't know what to do next. I'm afraid. I'm confused. Keep coming. Not <laughs> You know what I heard everybody shouting out? I shouted out a few of them, but I didn't shout out the word that I heard the most. I'm mad about this. This student is bringing me more work, and it's work that I didn't expect. And I'm not entirely sure how to go about it. And it's going to be the Pareto principle all over again. I'm going to spend 80% of my time on this 20% of my students. So, the typical presentation starts out by talking about students with disabilities. So with me, awesome. And then when we go back and talk to our provosts, our chancellors, our presidents, our deans, our faculty members about students with disabilities, what emotion are we conjuring up with them? It's a negative emotion of some kind. And that is one of the things that people with disabilities have been fighting against for years. Just treat us like anybody else. Also now, think about the built environment. When you walked into the hotel and you were driving your luggage, did you have to schlep it up over a curb? No. Walk. Yeah, 88, people are saying it. The Americans with Disabilities Act. Flashback to 1986. People in wheelchairs, people with prosthetics, people with walkers, canes, crutches, standing outside the doors of public libraries, courthouses, and schools all over the United States with signs that say, your stairs won't let me in. It was a huge advocacy effort to be able to just gain access to buildings. And that fight has largely been won now. 
to the extent that we don't even think about the built environment, the buildings which, in which we work, live, and play. We don't even think about curb cuts. We just know that we can push the stroller with the kids in it across the street more easily. We know that we can ride our bicycles on the sidewalks. We know that we can push our shopping carts. We know that we can step up with our luggage into the hotel on a flat pack. I took advantage of it at breakfast this morning. I had my luggage in tow, and I went up the ramp and was able to get to the food. So how do we get to that fight's been won with universal design for learning and strategies for our classrooms? No different, only different in your mind. You must learn what you have to hear. <laughs> we should listen to you. And so if we think about the history of POD, um, it's kind of uncanny how the major <coughs> inclusivity sessions really track well with the years when the Star Wars movies came out. He said, hinting at future things. <laughs> So I'd like to do another thought experiment. I'd like to give you something that you can take back to your campus and implement it tomorrow. Before we do it, though, I want to say one thing and introduce you to another fictional character. The one thing is, if we're training our faculty members on how to use universal design for learning principles, and that's all we're training, we're missing an opportunity. My contention is that if we focus on our folks in IT, the multimedia services folks, thank you Cameron and Kevin for being our audio guys today. If we focus on our center staff, our people in our learning support centers, writing centers, everybody who works with faculty members in reaching out to students, if we show them how to adopt universal design principles, then when a faculty member goes to your video people and says, hey, I want to let your captain, the answer is yes, and we'll help you with the captions. Yes, and we'll help you do the transcript. An improv, they call it the yes and <laughs> approach. So, anybody with foreign language capability uh, tell us who my friend is here? Read the name out loud real quick. Read more books. Yes, they get worse. <laughs> Reed is a fictional professor of American literature at a very large research institution somewhere in the middle of the United States. Reed is in no way modeled on one of my actual friends from Indiana University Bloomington in the history department. <laughs> Anyone who tells you differently is lying, right? Okay. So Reed teaches detective fiction. So here's a, a mental experiment. Bob is now 40 years old. So go back to 1975, the waning of the age of noir fiction. What are some words that you associate with film noir or noir fiction, detective fiction? Just shout. Trench coats. Cigarette smokes. French people, darkness, <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> no, it's true, really. They had drinks. Love to see. 1940s. Zoot suit, very nice. Those of you who are out in karaoke you know that's dear to my heart. <laughs> Femme fatale, curvy ladies in tight dresses, right? Say it. <laughs> Misogyny. <laughs> Right, so Reed teaches detective fiction. I gotta do this right, and I hope this thing will me. It was a Friday afternoon. The office was dark. The shades were drawn and the fan was going because it was a hot day in San Francisco. This curvy lady, oh excuse me, misogyny, this curvy dame walked in. I could tell she was troubled, and I liked her already. She had a case. My husband was dead, and everyone said that she had done it. Hell, I thought she had done it, but for her, I'd go through anything. Right? Okay, so, so that we've got the mental picture, right? Keep that mental energy, because Reed teaches this stuff. 
Now, you all applauded because there was an emotional upwelling there, right? Also, you don't usually see your presenter lying on tape. <laughs> this is exactly what Reed wants his students to do. He wants them to read the fiction, see the movies, go home, get engrossed in them, get engaged with them. He wants his students to really catch on fire. Here's a student reading the comic book versions of stuff because he can't get enough of it. You know, lights out under the covers because the other guys in the dorm room are like, hey, let's play beer pong. And this kid's like, no, this is better. <laughs> By the way, if you ever get one of these students, treasure this. <laughs> this is what reading students actually end up doing. They're reading the book on their Kindle, on the bus, on the way home from work. Reed wants all of his students to be the traditional 18, 19 year old freshmen. Most of his students these days are working adults. At my institution, my mythical average student is a 32 year old Latino single mother with two kids and a job at UPS. So, how do we reconcile what we want our students to do with what our students are actually doing? I'll suggest that Universal Design for Learning is a great way to reach this. Now, Reed is talking about recasting one of his courses so that his students can gain access to learning and study time on their mobile devices. He's thinking about going to an online course. He hasn't done it yet. He's teaching face-to-face. -face. And he has this link that he's going to have to be the 24-7 prop. We've all heard this, right? I have to respond to my students within 20 minutes of them texting me, or Instagramming me, or Snapchatting me, or periscoping me, or buzzfeeding me. I'm throwing that one in there for you guys in the back, right? Or sending me articles at 2 in the morning. Those of, us who were, those of us who were up at 2 in the morning, we would have no problem doing this. Although our responses might not have been terribly coherent. <laughs> but Reed has this nightmare about what are the expectations for being a digital professor. Does it mean now that I'm always on the clock? I used to be able to go home and spend time with my family. I used to have time for privacy, for my own personal life, for my own research agenda. I've placed information vital to the survival of the rebellion into the memory systems of the R2 unit. <laughs> so we should listen to Princess Leia. Prince, oh, well placed game, whoever that was. Because Princess Leia, how did she get a message to Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yeah, she hid it inside R2-D2, right? And then what happened? Tell me the story of how they figured out the message was there. Luke was cleaning the droid. Yeah, Luke was cleaning the droid, and he accidentally bumped something, and the message comes out. Awesome response from the back. Cool. So Luke was cleaning his droid, and the message just came out. These days, if we want to get a message to someone, if I happen, thank God I have the box. If I happen to be cleaning my droid, uh, right, and the message just comes out, hey, somebody wants to get a hold of me at the pod conference. Okay, awesome. Let's connect and go have a go have a drink and talk, right? So similar thing. We haven't changed that much in 40 years. We can still be cleaning our droids and message comes out. Awesome such Thank you. <laughs> By the way, I haven't paid anyone to say anything, but my back. So, so in terms of. How does Reed do this? What's one strategy that Reed could adopt to help his students to connect via their mobile devices? A bunch of factory developers are actually thinking this one through, which is awesome. Uh, I, I hear use the mobile devices, tweet back to you, you can come. Allow the students to use them in class, as part of class. Create a hashtag. Create a hashtag for your course, awesome. Live tweet their reading. Say again? Um, allow people to have their phones within their site when they're in the classroom. Okay, cool. Flip the class. Nice. My people in the back have got a lot of love. I'll spend some time back here. Facebook group? Facebook group. Yeah, there's a lot of different strategies that Reed could use to connect to people on their mobile devices. Has Reed thought about universal design for learning at all yet? Probably not. So let's actually help Reed. 
These are some of my favorite comics. It's probably the one thing that you're going to see on the screen that's a little small, so I want to point out the one in the very lower left-hand corner. It's Sam, boy detective versus the vice lords of crime. This is what I thought it was like back when I was 12 years old. This is a 12-year-old blonde kid. In front of him is a police officer who's been shot, and he's down. So not only does Sam pick up the police officer's gun and shield the curvy lady, pardon me, misogyny, curvy dame, uh, from the bullets, but he picks up the police officer's cap and puts it on and deputizes himself and starts shooting it out with the mafiosi against whom he's fighting. But universal design for learning, you've heard it given to you as multiple means of representing information. If you've got a video, it has some text to go with it. If you've got a set of lecture notes, have an audio podcast that goes with it. Um, and faculty members can get confused about what multiple means means. They can think, I have to make alternative versions of every single thing I've got, and I've got to make five of them. I want to suggest that when we're talking to our IT folks, and our multimedia folks, and our faculty members, adopt a plus one mentality. If you have something already in one format, just make one more. This is manageable. This is something that people can actually do tomorrow. And it doesn't involve, oh, I have to recast my entire class for the content. Multiple ways of representing information. Adopt that plus one mentality. <laughs> now, for Katie, those essays that she was writing for her course they improved because Katie was able to figure out a way to work around the limitations of the assignment. Katie was actually able to use Dragon Naturally Speaking to create a written work. What happens if Katie's professor had said, okay, for this assignment, what I'm really after, my objectives, really are, I want you to be able to come up with an idea refer to the research, and then give me details, evidence, and examples that show that you're thinking in a cogent way about the research. None of that is, please give me inch margins and double space, and make sure that you have an APA correctly formatted title page. So if the professor were to say, plus one, write me a three-page essay, or take out your phone and get that selfie camera working in a good way, and give me a short video that explains what you mean. So plus one, how do students tell us what they can demonstrate? How do students demonstrate their skills? There will be someone who says, but I teach writing, I teach format. If the objective of the assignment, if the objective of the course is to learn the format, then don't give options. I teach business writing. One of the things that we do, I'm not entirely sure why, but we're required to still teach people how to write memos. <laughs> this is a session on 40 years ago, so we're still there. Right? Inch margins, to, from, subject, in, ray, bold that, move that over. Don't sign your name at the end, that's the mark of a rookie. Just initially. So when the format is the assignment, it's okay not to give options. But if you can give options on the drafts, on the things that people are working on, then by all means do it. You're going to give your students an, a choice as to how they do it. Benefit for us as designers, as IT people, as teachers, say I've got 40 students and I ask them to give me that three-page essay. Well, after I get to about essay number 27, they all start sounding the same. I've been teaching for many years, so they all start sounding the same no matter what, because they all sound like the previous semester's students at this point. And they all make the same mistakes, they all have the same kinds of strengths. It's all the same, the same, the same, the same. So out of my 40 essays, by the time I hit essay number 27, I'm questioning the policy on campus that doesn't allow me to keep gin in my desk drawer. <laughs> so giving students alternatives for how they represent their skills actually helps me too. It makes it a little more lively. I'll break through the essays, I'll look at a few of the videos, so on. 
and it allows me to create a library of good student work that I can then pass on to more students, and it doesn't involve me doing the work. Ooh, wait, putting the students to work for me. Ha, 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 right. Okay, so learner engagement, plus one on representing information, and plus one on students' action choices. How do students stay engaged with the material? Here is where we as faculty developers, designers, technologists can really move the needle for universal design for learning. If we have faculty members who say, I am and stop, students will not understand this material unless they see me standing in front of them and talking to them. They can't get it any other way. Do lecture capture and just put my hour and a half worth of brilliance up there and the students will watch it. I hear the nervous laughter, right? You're thinking this through, you're thinking the students will never watch that. So if we can tell folks, let's chunk up the material. Let's alternate getting information with giving information, or interacting, or even doing a little thought exercise, or tweeting a prediction, or filling in your name on the prize drawing, or yeah, you see where I'm going. But if we can give students many ways to stay engaged, and many ways so that they have some choices as to how they work through their experience of our courses, whether that's face-to-face, -face, online, blended, Saturday only, Wednesday night, you name it. So here's the wait a second moment. We started off our time together talking about people with all right, disabilities. So what about people with disabilities? I thought universal design for learning was about people with disabilities. I want to make a radical suggestion. I want to say that universal design for learning equals access no matter why. And in fact, now that most of our students have mobile devices, we have a stronger case to be able to say that universal design for learning benefits everybody and not just a narrow group of people. Why do faculty members often not employ universal design for learning? A, it's a lot of work. We all know that. B, they see that the work is going to benefit only a very narrow fraction of their students, or what they perceive as a very narrow fashion. Katie's story tells us, and tells faculty members everywhere, that not everybody who was even diagnosed with a disability in K-12 will claim that when they get to college. In fact, there's a huge drop-off. Number of students with an IEP in K-12, up here. That's about maybe 40% or so, and then only about 15 to 20% of those students actually declare disability when they are legally adults and have to do it themselves. And they come into our colleges and universities. But with regard to mobile devices, think about how access works today. Think about that single mother who has to put the kids to bed at 9 o'clock but still needs to study for Professor Don's class. She wants to watch Professor Don's video. Turn off the sound, turn on the captions. She's just found time for study that she didn't have in her day previously. Think about your overseas military deployed learners in a place where there isn't broadband access, but they still want to keep up with the study for their coursework. They're able to download the PDF, the Microsoft Word version, the outline, the text-only version and keep up with their studies even if they can't see the complex 3D modeling and the nice multimedia packages that they've created for them. They get something instead of nothing. And that's where we have the most powerful argument for UDL, is giving an experience and making time for study that wasn't there before. At my university, the professed goal of our online programs is not to get students from Hawaii and Manitoba and Mississippi. It is to allow the students who are in our geographical mandate, up to 20 miles in a circle around our university, to be able to time shift. What is the number one reason students drop classes or drop out of university and college altogether? Time commitments. 
If we can find time during those 24 hours that students have that they didn't have before, we will get a net gain in student persistence and student retention. UDL is a retention issue. Let me get to the meat of it and let me get you to what you can bring home with you tomorrow. I was talking with Sam Johnson. She is a research scientist at CAST, Center for Applied Special Technology in Boston. Last year, CAST put out a website called UDL on Campus. It is a whole bunch of resources for you. I mentioned it when we started, I'll mention it again. Let me quote from Sam here, probably one of the few times I'll read a slide to you. This is important. We want a situation that is good for everybody. Part of it is thinking about what has to happen at the level of design to make accommodation less necessary. Most of us in this room know the difference between design and accommodation. Accommodation is, Professor Mary, I have my piece of paper. Please do something special for me. Professor Don, I have my piece of paper. Please do something special for me. <laughs> design is making it less necessary that people have to come to you with the paper in the first place. And this is probably the hardest conversation to have with folks in IT, with folks in your learning support center, with folks in your multimedia area, with your faculty members. Because what you're selling, what you're saying, is do some work now. Maybe you can do a lot of work now. And in subsequent semesters, in the future, you will save yourself effort, you will save yourself grief, you will receive fewer confused email messages from your students, and you will have fewer students requesting specific accommodations that creep up on you by surprise. So Reed's going to take a step into the ether and he wants to do some multimedia, he's going to create a video for his course. Here's what you can use tomorrow. If you leave with nothing else, these are your five things. Five strategies for universal design for learning. We'll start off with the easy one, the one that you all already know, and that is strategy number one, start with text. If a faculty member, a multimedia designer, an IT person, an instructional designer, if you start with sketchy notes, a script, an outline, it doesn't matter what kind of text it is. Those of you up front can see that this is a uh, script for a commercial about little curated pods, except they don't have coffee in them, they have like entire meals in them. Yeah, this product didn't fly. You know, the last line here is, mmm, that's good duck. But if you start with a script, if you start with some notes on what you want to do or say, then anytime you do or say those things, you've automatically got a skeleton on which you can hang an alternative version. Asterisk is strategy number one. If you are a, I just like to talk to the camera and I'll write it up later sort of person, do that. Absolutely do that. Starting with text, getting in the habit of being a text first sort of process person, helps you and helps the people whom you are helping to be able to do plus one without even thinking about it. It's just the way we do business at our institution. So strategy number one, start with text. Nothing revolutionary here. We're all on ground over. I think we all agree. Right? Awesome. Anybody not? Converse. All right, we'll get there. Strategy number two is make some alternatives. Here we have a chemistry professor in your lab and two students. She is teaching a class in her learning management system. And as she's teaching the class, she's asked these students to come in and videotape her teaching her online class. Dry and boring, right? Right. This is the part where you think I'm going to convince you otherwise. No, it's just dry and boring. <laughs> but what they're doing is they're taking the materials from the online class and turning them into PDF references for the students. What they're doing is they're taking the video and chopping it up into the professor talking to the screen and then turning around and talking to the camera about the process of being an online student. What they're doing is they're taking still images out of the video and creating a series of still images to show a process. People can often understand steps and processes better by looking at the still images and the video. If you're going to get on a plane to go home after this conference, 
and they tell you, please look at the safety instructions in your seat back pocket, do it. Don't watch the little video that plays on the TV in front of you. It'll be cute. You'll see people in airline uh, uniforms and locations around the world, and it'll be, here are the exits of the aircraft and all this stuff, and you will completely forget it as soon as you start watching the free Wi-Fi Game of Thrones episodes on your plane. But if you look at that safety information card, simple graphics, still images, some of them taken from those very same videos, but we process still images more quickly, more sequentially, and the neuroscientists tell us that this is an evolutionary advantage to us, that if we see something static, we pay attention to it. When we see movement, we respond with our lizard brain. Oh my god, is that a threat? The third strategy, let people do it their own way. This is plus one on students representing how they make their information, how they demonstrate their skills. So up here at the front, here's a, another little bit of text that those of you in the back might, might not be able to read, but to read this for you. The effect of chocolate and cocoa flavonoids on plasma lipids and lipoproteins associated with cardiovascular disease. In plain English, this means... Murmur, murmur, murmur. Yes, absolutely. Dark chocolate is good for you. In a very specific way, it benefits your heart. So as you can see some of the little chocolates out by the registration desk here, they do have the dark ones. We have to dig for them. <laughs> so be polite. Just dump it all out on the counter so other people can get at it. And, you know, share. But this is the three-page essay problem, right? This is, if I get 40 of these, Perhaps students who have difficulty with written expression, whether it's due to a learning disability, whether it's due to a physical disability, or whether it's due to the fact that they're just beginning writers. If you offer them the opportunity to turn on a microphone and do a podcast, and upload that podcast to a place like SoundCloud or Flickr, and then give the web address for that podcast, I might not give them that option on the final exam, or the final project, or an essay that's worth a lot of points, for the draft work, though, I want to give my students all the choice that I possibly can. Same thing with create a video. Pretend that you're reporting on it, or, or give us your thoughts in draft format as you go along. Turn that selfie camera around. So if strategy one was, start with text, right? Strategy two was, make alternatives. You guys are paying attention, great. And strategy three is let them do it their way. Strategy four is go step by step. If we chunk things up, if we give students mileposts, if we give students signs of where they are, where they've been, where they're going, they're much more likely to see the structure and then learn the structure, and then the structure becomes invisible to them and they start thinking on higher orders of cognition. I'm coming over here because David McCurry has actually done some research on this. And he's giving me the, the struck eyes. He's like, no, I haven't. I'm like, yes, you have. You've told me about the A and B tests that you've done with your students in a small, small setting. But in terms of just giving students more structure to work within. In the military, when they're training folks, and it's how do you assemble and disassemble your firearm safely, they use a strategy called, first we tell them what we're going to tell them, then we tell them, then we tell them what we told them. Repetition, having the same structure throughout. You course designers, you know this one already, and this is something that you can teach your IT people how to do. You can teach your multimedia people how to do. You can teach the folks in your writing centers, learning support centers, how to do this in their own course and curriculum design. So not only chunk up the information, but repeat structures, repeat elements, repeat processes for your students. I am a huge believer in the power of repetition. I'll say that again, I'm a huge believer in the power of repetition. And I, I stole that completely from Daniel Pink, so I apologize. But going step by step, so for example up here, watch a video, then read a case study, then discuss get interactive, have places along the way where students must pause and do something different. In the United Kingdom, 
There is a great university from which I have a degree, and I'm very proud to have its diploma on my lap. It is the University of Butts and Seats. It was a joke. The whole university was set up to, as a parody of diploma mills where you just pay your money to get a degree. Um, I, I could have gotten a degree in basket weaving. I chose a degree in backside seat differentiation. <laughs> uh, those of you who know the, the vulgar turn of the phrase, he knows his blank from his seat. But the University of Butts and Seats is actually not the place where I want to get my degree. I want to get my degree from the University of Get Their Butts Out of Their Seats. Every time we talk about teaching with technology, we think that our learners are going to be on their mobile devices, or have their laptops in front of them, or sitting in their living rooms at home on their computers. One of the great ways to encourage going step by step is to break the steps up so that students must leave their devices behind. Must go out and observe something in the real world. Go to your local coffee shop and count the number of people who are walking in with yoga mats versus not. Sociology class. This is an actual experiment from one of my real colleagues, not real. Go out and interview someone at your local high school or elementary school who is in a leadership role, an IT manager, the principal, and ask one cogent question that has to do with the content that we're talking about in our course. Real example from our college of education class. If you can break up the structure keep people within a same structure, but break up what they're doing. That's a universal design for learning strategy. So strategy number one will start with text. Number two was? All right, make alternatives. The third one? All right, make them, let them do it their way. The fourth one is going step by step. And that fifth strategy is set content free. Two different senses of the word free. First, set it free from the clock. Let's get our students information, materials, and interactions that they can do when they're not there with us. If you're teaching a completely asynchronous online course, then your materials have to be free from the clock. Let's filter that back down to our hybrid courses, our flipped courses, to our people who are teaching in the face-to-face -face classroom. And this is where working with our IT folks and working with our multimedia folks and our support staffers at our institutions is crucial. Because they're the ones who will suggest to faculty members, oh yeah, we could make some videos and then you wouldn't have to be on call 24 hours a day. Oh yeah, we could set this up on our media server or in our learning management system or on our website for you. And you could have a presence for students when they are able to study for your class. Also, set content free from formats. <coughs> set content free from format. I have to come up here because I have to talk to you about a very serious problem in higher education today. I'm standing behind the lectern it makes me appear more important. <laughs> This very serious problem in higher education today is the scourge of narrated PowerPoint slides. <laughs> PowerPoint slides in which there are no graphics or images. Natasha, wherever you are, bless you for having a session at Pod this year for, and, and, uh, and all of our folks here on visual design. But narrated PowerPoint slides are the scourge of higher academia. You see them crop up in unlikeliest of places. Faculty members who come to us fresh out of their graduate programs will be accosted by narrated PowerPoint slides saying, hey, you want something cheap, right? <laughs> These narrated PowerPoint slides have been bothering our faculty members for years and years and years. It's only text, there's no graphics, and then faculty members feel obliged simply to read what's on the screen, causing cognitive dissonance and making things worse for their students. It is helping to stamp out the scourge of narrated PowerPoint slides. Thus, end of the commercial. Thank you for this PSA. I'll get back down to the air. <laughs> Sorry about that. And 
but setting content free. How many of you folks have in your courses or in the designs that you help your faculty members do specific software that the faculty member wants to use? Maple, SPSS, um, you know, engineering software, specialized stuff that nobody else in the institution uses, right? Okay, cool. How much does it cost the students to get the license for that software? Zero for you guys, awesome, you're funding it. Zero for you guys. Only if they're using it through the LMS. Yep, we've got site licenses for most of this stuff. At my institution, we don't do that. Our students have to buy their own individual education licenses for that software. Set content free means if a professor is showing people how to do something in a particular piece of software, don't make that demo be a file from that particular piece of software. And this holds true not just for the specialized stuff. This holds true for PowerPoint. This holds true for Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, stuff that everybody has access to, that people can trip over. Why so? Students on your sports team are going to play an opponent who lives in a city far away. And the sports team doesn't have time to study other than their time on the bus and they want to watch or encounter a course material set from a professor. If they have to have Microsoft Word on their devices, most of us haven't downloaded OpenOffice or Office 360 onto our phones. But well, most of us have, but not our students. If, our, if the uh, professor wants the students to use specialized accounting software, specialized mathematical software, <coughs> if students are on their mobile devices, chances are there's not a mobile device version of that software. Unless, as this gentleman said, they get it through our LMS and it just ports to them. But even then, there's glitches because if you're working on something on your phone, the full software is not going to replicate on the Android or the iPhone operating system well. It doesn't play nicely. So when people are creating content, all of us, faculty members whom we work with, if we can take what's on our screens and do screen recordings with things like Camtasia, Screencast-O-Matic, ScreenR, Jing for the five-minute freebies, doing the audio podcasting in ways that stream out over the internet and you don't have to have anything other than an internet browser. Every mobile device today ships with an internet browser and you're much more likely to give access to students if you can put it into a format that doesn't require special software in order to be seen. This problem is rapidly going away. I'm happy to be able to report this. It's not there yet though. And I also have to apologize that Here's somebody who's watching a professional football game and who has clicked into the SAT feature on the television so that this person can follow the play-by-play -play in the football game. And I have to apologize, this is the only time that I will ever put any Dallas Cowboys anything on the screen. <laughs> I don't want to go there, but I have many friends from Dallas. My hometown team, I couldn't find a photograph of anybody doing an accessible thing. In fact, the photographs from my hometown team my hometown team was just voted the only fans in the NFL, so I can't, uh, I can't, don't call oh, yeah. <laughs> So strategy one was, start with text. Okay, strategy two, make some alternatives. Strategy three, do it there with awesome. I like the loud on that one. Strategy four, step by step, and this one is set content free. Why you? Plus and wise the ways of science. <laughs> Not the only 40th anniversary out there. <laughs> Those of you who remember Monty Python and the Holy Grail, there's universal design for learning all over Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Sir Bedeker using his largest scales in order to determine whether someone is a witch because she weighs the same as a duck. Empirical evidence, multiple ways of demonstrating if they end up throwing her in the pond. Okay. <laughs> so here's a real quick review for you, and then we'll wrap it up, and then we'll give out some prizes. So if you haven't done so yet, and if you don't have one in front of you, these are your tickets for the prize drawing. Fold it in half so the sticky is sticking to itself. Write your name on it and be prepared. If you don't have one where you're sitting, 
come up here awkwardly and grab one from the front end. <laughs> so start with text. Create alternative ways for people to demonstrate what they are telling students. Create alternative ways for the learners to show what they know. Break things up into their separate components. And then expand and create interactions that are in media that are accessible without special devices. These are five things you can do tomorrow on your campuses. I see a few cameras pointing at the screen. It's awesome. I will come up here like this. <laughs> right? But I'll also say that everything I'm sharing with you is going to be on Wikipedia tomorrow. We've got it set for conditional release. I share everything, including the handout, which will be out there later under Creative Commons. So please don't reinvent the wheel. Go back to your campuses, energized, charged up. You've listened to yoga, you've internalized it. Awesome. But let's check in with Reed one last time. So Reed made this video. And uh, the need to make changes is not always that obvious. Reed, you know, did this plus one, that kind of thing. Some people are laughing, and some people are not laughing yet because you don't see what I saw. My wife and I were going grocery shopping last November, just before pod, actually. We live in Chicago, so there is actually snow there. And as we were coming up, we passed by the space, parking spaces very close to the store. And we saw in the disabled parking slot the carpet here. Oh. oh, yeah. So I took a picture. I sent a tweet. Dear name of store, not cool. Power of Twitter, 10 minutes later, I get a tweet back. We are calling the store manager right now. <coughs> Power of Twitter. But it's not always this obvious. Faculty members will say, well, what's wrong with going on teaching? My students get, get through, right? I don't teach any students with disabilities. <laughs> Subjects that I can see. So, Instead of talking to faculty members, IT people, about students with disabilities, let's also talk to them about students with mobile devices. Let's flip the script on this one. Now, I have to be careful about making this recommendation. People in the disability advocacy community are still fighting for visibility of voice, access, and being heard. I do not want to suggest that we replace the conversation about people with disabilities with the conversation about people with their mobile devices. What I want to suggest is that the mobile device conversation is a lovely Trojan horse that benefits everybody and directly benefits learners with disabilities. By getting faculty members into the mindset of, I'm going to do this work for everybody, it lowers the threshold for being willing to do the work. Question or comment, please. Yeah, what about our international students who don't have American domestic phones? What about international students who don't have American domestic phones? And or students with no internet access. And or students with no internet access. One of our challenges in universal design for learning is giving access to people who don't have mobile access for themselves. You come up with two excellent examples of groups who typically don't. That's where we are still serving students in an old-fashioned way, with our computer labs, with our open lab times, with our loaner laptop programs, with our technology grant programs. There are ways that we can reach out to students who are either disadvantaged or coming from a situation where they don't have technology that's compatible. But you're absolutely right that we don't have to expect that everyone comes in the door with what we want them to have technologically. At the same time, at my institution, 87% of our students are Pell Grant, el Pell Grant eligible. We serve students whom other places don't serve at all. <coughs> students who are first-generation college learners, 
typically from a lower socioeconomic stratum. And what we found, and the Pew Research Center validates this in a couple of their recent studies, what we found is that our students have a choice in their technology between a PC or a laptop and a mobile phone. Almost everybody chooses a mobile phone. It is their digital life. And folks will, it used to be that there was a, a complaint among some folks that you, know, you would drive through a neighborhood that had lower socioeconomic folks living in it, and you'd see satellite dishes in the 1980s and 1990s. Well, how come them poor people got cable, right? No, it's because they wanted to be connected. It's because they wanted to have some kind of technology. And the same is often true today. So your question highlights something that allows us to say, OK, well, we can expect even folks whom 10 years ago, they wouldn't have had a phone, they wouldn't have had any internet connected device, those numbers are rapidly coming up. So the, our stopgap programs, like a laptop owner program, can get a little smaller and a little more targeted. So excellent question. There's another comment here, too. I'm a sociologist, and there's a huge literature about the existence still of the digital platform. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's <laughs> when we're expecting students to do all this, putting the burden on So for those of you in the back who might not have heard the question, let me see if I can paraphrase. So what about students uh, for whom the digital divide is still real? Or for those students who are choosing to lead unplugged lives? Um, the questioner teaches the course called Voluntary Simplicity, which is an awesome course title. And it allows me to talk about what's on the back of my phone. This is a wallpaper design from William Morris. William Morris was a 19th century British designer and artist he made beautiful, illuminated books by hand in the old medieval manner. He created his own wallpaper patterns and designs and made the dyeing process by hand himself. So he's thought of as a Luddite, a throwback, somebody who purposely chooses not to be connected with his time and connected with an earlier time. What most folks know about him is the quotation is, have nothing in your home that you do not know to be beautiful or useful. Why do I have this on the back of my phone? A, the phone's not turned on. Voluntary simplicity. B, it's a reminder that this is just a tool. And if this tool doesn't do what I want it to do, or it complicates my life in a way that I don't want to complicate it, I should not use it that way. And so, for those students who are either voluntarily or through no choice of their own, falling in that digital divide, that's where those outreach programs where we were talking a couple seconds ago with loaner programs, with structured lab time. We should never get rid of our computer labs. We should still offer access for course purposes to our students. Now, for those students who want to have that more face-to-face -face and less technologically mediated experience, Universal Design for Learning does not mean replace those with technology. It just means offer choices. That plus one that I was talking about, I think, resonates very well with your bent in your course. Because it allows students to attend face-to-face -face classes. And if the professor has extra stuff that allows them to study time outside of the classroom, but they don't want to use those technology mediations, there's not content in there that is exclusively web content that isn't something that we've talked about already. It's study guides. It's plus instead of um, separate from. So that's a real short answer to the question, and I'd love to continue the conversation with you after we have our time here today. Excellent question to ask right here. And actually, the need to make changes is not always this obvious. I had an opportunity to go into Chinatown in San Francisco, and you know, I, I really love good Chinese food. But a few months ago, my system administrator and I were thinking about how we could 
give folks an understanding of the universal design for learning in a quick sort of one-page way. And I said, yeah, you know, multiple ways of representing information, multiple ways of demonstrating skill, multiple ways of staying engaged, but how do we put that all on one page? You know, how does it be like columns or something? And my assistant administrator said, yeah, you can make like, you know, like a Chinese menu, like pick one from column A and one from column B and all that stuff. And I said, yeah, like a Chinese menu. <laughs> Please forgive me if this appears culturally insensitive. The Chinese menu was invented by Chinese Americans. <coughs> if you travel in China, you will not see Chinese menus that look like this. This was invented by folks who were operating Chinese restaurants in the United States. So I'm humbly claiming part of that tradition. This is from our Center for Teaching and Learning. And we just have, here are some specific things that faculty members, designers, IT people can do with, instead of prices, a minimum and maximum estimate of about how much time it's going to take. Because that's a huge, huge faculty concern. How much effort am I going to have to put into this? How much time is this going to take? So what we did was we came up with these estimates. We've also put links here to CAST, to the National Center on Universal Design for Learning. San Francisco State University, give yourselves a hand and make the list. All right, give them a hand too. Yeah, they probably got like a whoop whoop and there's two people are like, yeah, oh, it's yeah. Okay. <laughs> University of North Carolina, Stephanie Moore has a great online tutorial there. The asterisk down here, we don't actually sell food, but we do help you reach out to your students in ways to help them to succeed. And you know what the hardest part about putting a Chinese menu together is? Finding the font characters for the blasted chili pepper. It took me like an hour to put the whole thing together and another hour to find the chili pepper font and character. So, it is now time. Simple. If you would kindly trust your neighbors and pass your entries to the person who is sitting close to the, closest to the center of the room. While you are doing that passing, I'm going to come out the back here and walk it out. It is time to do the prize run. All right, here we go. People sitting closest. People sitting closest. All right, awesome. Fantastic. If you are the person sitting closest to the center of the room, like these good people are doing in the back, come on to the center of the room and drop in the entries for your colleagues. Awesome, awesome, awesome. This is the kinetic part of the presentation. Oh, and, and here is a an honest soul who dropped one, not her own, and picked it up and put it in. There is trust in the room. We love it. Awesome. We have folks coming to the center of the room to drop in the entries. These entries are in a lovely multicolored jungle. Has anyone missed an opportunity to put in an entry? All right. Okay. Now, building suspense. <laughs> for our first book, Louis Lord Nelson's Design is Deliver a Common Plan Universal Design for Learning. First person who says the word stop means I'll stop. Stop. <laughs> Alright. I have a winner in my hand. If your ticket was a pink ticket, you're in the running. <laughs> Where is Steve Hewitt? Come on down. Here's your book. It is another pink ticket. 
And I'm going to fucking fold it. I see it on the inside. I'm kidding. I'm completely kidding. You guys know what I'm talking about. Where is Ari and Sarah? Thank you again for attending pod for your anniversary. 